Hello everyone, today is Thursday, July 7, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week is brought to you by me, once again, and more specifically, my trading service. Check that out on my website. Uh, you can go to davelander.com slash trading service if you watch a recording on this. I should have a link to it. I guess before we get to talking about trading, there's a screen screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, I want to talk about Brexit, obviously, and other catastrophic news, and we'll follow up on that. Charts in the chart show, what a concept. I woke up this morning thinking, what am I going to talk about? These shortened holiday weeks kind of make it hard because not enough stuff develops sometimes. And But I say, hey, you know what? Let's just look at some charts. So we'll do that both in the slides and then obviously we'll hop out uh, to the uh, the bigger database and look at some things. Uh, how to switch hats from swing trading and longer term trading. We have a, uh, an ongoing example there that's working out pretty good, knock on wood. So I want to just kind of show you that. Uh, obviously, your questions on trading, anything you want to know, just let me know. We'll try to get to it best we can. Anything that requires a lot of thought or effort, we'll, uh, we'll get to in upcoming weeks. It'll be fought for the next show. And then, obviously, your favorite stock picks. Uh, what you do, for those of you who are new to the show, we could talk about as many stocks as you want. Just uh, put a stock in and hit return. And ideally, we want to talk about stocks that are trending and ideally set up. But um, if you're asking, if you want to know whether a stock is trending or not, that's fine, too. But we are trend traders. All right, let's just hop right into it. First of all, let's talk about this Brexit thing. So in markets, a lot of times, after all is said and done, a lot more is said than done. So we remember just last week or so, it was like, oh, there's not going to be a Brexit. We took a poll. And then my uh, British friends from across the pond reminded me how abysmal the last few polls were, or last big poll they took. Uh, and how wrong it was. So that was kind of interesting. And then obviously Brexit happened and it looked like the market was just going to fall apart. And then all of a sudden it just came right back up. And so now the next thing is next. Now we'll have a little bit more to say about this later in the show. The point I want to make is you got to be careful not getting too caught up in the news events. And then this is a kind of the what me worry type of thing. And, and that's what I wrote about last week. Uh, what me worry about that? And it's like, seems like the market has completely shrugged it off. And by the way, with these news events, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but sometimes you could look at where the news or the pre-news day and then wait for the news to happen. And then you could go long when it closes above that news day. Now, I'm not a huge fan of trading news with this type of, methodology or system, however you want to look at it, but you can have it in your toolbox or an arrow in your quiver, however you want to look at it, to kind of help factor in a lot of other things. And we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. The bottom line that I want to make is that news is noise. And what I'd like, what I'll probably do, I need to make a note of my, to myself, I'm still on this planet five years from now, to say, hey, you guys pick out the Brexit trade in the charts. And you're going to have a very hard time doing that, the, the, the Brexit, I'm sorry, reaction in the charts. Greg Morris, who we'll often talk about, he'll, when he does a presentation, he'll often pull up a chart going back about 10 years in a stock, and I think it's AOL. And he'll say, okay, there were a couple of Gulf Wars, 9-11, and, you know, try to pick out the events. And you might be able to pick out maybe one or two, but it's nearly impossible. Then he says there's however many earnings periods, uh, 30 or 40 or whatever. And it's like, or, were they good earnings or were they bad earnings? And if, even if you could pick out the, where the earnings are, were they good, were they bad? And the bottom line is that news is noise. And longer term, it's absolutely impossible to use it in trading. And the only, in fact, the only way you can actually use it if you were to make a trade is to possibly wait for the reaction and look to play the opposite side. And that's either on an intraday reversal or a multi-day reversal like we just saw with the Brexit. And the other thing is, anybody remember Greece? I wrote a column, Market Slips on Greece, spelled G-R-E-E-C-E, -E -E, little play on words there, LOL. 
And my point there was a country the size of West Virginia, which I have down here, I think, is going to take down in the entire United States. Okay. So there's always something to worry about, even the situation in Nigeria. But the point is that news is noise, and the media is always going to blame it on something. And as I often say, if you could connect the dots between news and trading, then there'd be a lot more journalists becoming traders. I'm just saying. Now, this is not to say that news doesn't affect markets. It does, and it can. The point is that you can't predict it, first and foremost. And even if you could, the reaction is often muted and quite often the opposite of what it should be. I think I mentioned this in layman's. I had somebody call me up who felt, um, I don't know what word I looked, uh, motivated, inspired, whatever you want to say. But he had felt like he had to give me some inside information on a stock. And I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, I'm just, I, I'm not that kind of a trader. Um, there is no inside information as far as I'm concerned. And if there is, it, it'd be illegal to use anyway. But his point was that a stock was going to get bought out. He called me on a Friday and sure enough, on Monday, the stock got bought out. Well, what happened? The stock actually opened lower. It's a take under, okay, instead of a take over. So, even if you do know the news, a lot of times the reaction is just the opposite of what it should be. And a lot of times things obviously are baked into the cake. So again, last week I said, this is a slide from last week, you know, what me worry about the news? It's like death taxes and unlit oil rigs. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you the, the whole story of unlit oil rigs. But the bottom line is... If you're sailing the Gulf of Mexico, especially close to the coast, coast or fairly close to the coast, first 10 to 40 miles, I guess, there's a lot of oil rigs. And at night, they're, uh, they light them up. And then there's little – what's even worse is there's a lot of little gas platforms that, that sometimes they're unmanned. So there's a little light with a solar panel on there uh, charging the battery during the day. But you don't have to worry about them if they're not lit. If they're lit, you want to avoid them because if you hit them, you'll sink. But if they're not lit, you don't have to worry about it because you're not going to see them anyway until it's way too late. So, And then uh, like tanker, cargo tankers for big ocean racing. Uh, every now and then a cargo tanker will fall off a boat and it floats about two inches below the surface. And if you hit one, you go down. You hit a whale, you go down. Okay. But so you don't have to worry about whales. You don't have to worry about uh, cargo containers. And you don't have to worry about unlicked. Oil rigs, because it's, it's, you can do. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so don't worry about the news. The news. Uh, be careful not to chase your own tail. Okay, this Brexit thing. Everybody all excited. It's not going to happen. Market starts rallying. Or it did happen. Then the market sells off, and then all of a sudden now it just seems to be blowing it off, at least temporarily. And you could really end up chasing your own tail. You, you have to have a stop in place just in case. If you're already long coming into such an event or short, whatever the case may be, following your system, if you are, if you do have positions on, then as I often say, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And what I would suggest is do as you normally do. And what we've done in more recent times, and we're going to talk a lot about the sideways action in a few minutes, but what we've done in the more recent times as we've we've been very selective and the news event happened to set up with us being very selective because the market's going sideways so we continue to do what we do but if a great setup would have came in and this was a big uh, conversation we had a couple of weeks ago in a panel that i was on but if you're following a system you have to follow the system and in a Art Collins, who's a more of a mechanical trader, or a mechanical trader flat out, I guess, he was saying that if you do design a system, then you'd have to go back in the system and take out every possible news event that you would have avoided. And that's um, that could end up being an exercise of futility. But you have to take the good, the bad, and the indifferent. Because if you're looking at a longer-term type of system, or a system over the long term, I should say, it could be even a short-term system. But a lot of the big gainers in that system will come from positive news developments. 
And as a general statement, surprises generally ha happen in the direction of the trend. Now, we have no trend in the market, so the market's sideways, so you can't really argue uh, whether or not that surprise should have been up or down. But you want to basically do what you always do. So if you're coming into this thing and you're being real selective and then you see the mother of all setups and you think it's worthwhile, then take it. We had an IPO. I don't, I don't want to say it's the mother of all setups, but I think it's worth taking. And we didn't change our, our tune on that. We decided that oh, we're going to continue to keep an eye on this IPO for possible setup. Now, again, as I said earlier, a big picture news reversal can work. But use it more as a tool in your toolbox or general knowledge. So you have, let's say the market is trading here, and then you have the news event happens and the market sells off hard. Then if you are trading the news in and of itself, it's, it becomes more of a fade of the news. You would buy the market back here. Uh, I don't think it's worth trading this style, but it is. it is a bit, it does have a bit of an edge to it. And it can help you to have that that arrow in your quiver when you're making your decisions within your your bigger picture system or your other system. So I think it's a good thing to know. And then the, the example I've, I've given at, at nauseam is when a few years back I was speaking in uh, Dallas and somebody says, oh, Mr. Jobs is obviously going to die. What's going to happen to Apple? And I was like, well, I don't know what's going to happen to Apple, but if it sells off, as it probably will, when it crosses back above the day before it sold off, then buy Apple if you feel like you must trade off of that system. And if you go in and look, it, it had a pretty good run afterwards. It did take off forever. I mean, this is kind of a, a short-term aberration type trading, and I don't think it's worth going after longer term. But again, not to beat a dead horse, I think it's a good thing to have in your quiver. And it's just that, that useful piece of market knowledge or trivia, however you want to look at it, that can can maybe help you longer term, just knowing how these things work. Now, last week I did talk about how market timing is tough. So I want to talk, I would just kind of mention that real quick. This is a slide from last week. When, when you go to trade the overall market, you're fighting against the the one lotters, the uh, the midnight tokers, the smokers, the hedgers, the indexers. There's a lot of people in there fighting it out in the indices, and there's a lot of derivatives on the indices. The more derivatives there is on something, by the way, the more choppier it tends to be. Way back in my commodity days, when I was doing a lot of mechanical testing. I could make a system work in oil and maybe soybeans and some of these other markets, but it was very hard to make a trend following system work in something like S&P futures. And you always think, well, did the market just go up? It's like, yeah, sometimes it does, but it, it does so in such a choppy fashion. It's, it's difficult. And no, it does not. And by the way, it doesn't always go up. I guess you could say it often goes up. But the market could go 25 years or more without making new highs. And then we hit, what, 13-year lows back in 2009 or late 2000, 2008 at least. So it could, it could go down for a long time, and it could hit some pretty serious lows. And also it could lose 50% of its value along the way. Yeah, ho uh, hold off on stock picks for now, and we'll get to them in one second, just so I don't get them confused with the other questions. But, yeah, we'll open it up for uh, stocks in just one second. So again, a lot of players within the, it's a crowded playing field and you're fighting it out with a lot of people. Uh, but you still need a general framework to work within. So let's get back to the piece for a second. So by general framework, have some sort of point in mind that's not necessarily an all clear, okay? So the question is, if the market goes on to make new highs, this is the weekly S&P 500, would that be the all clear? And my example is, well, not exactly, but it would certainly be a positive development because the market could easily go to new highs and then come back in or go to new highs, spend a little time up there and come back in. So it's going to take some follow through up here. 
But you have to have a general framework, and we're going to talk about the sideways axis in just one minute, but I've been talking about this weekly bow tie down at nauseam that occurred last summer, okay? And then the market sold off a little bit, came back, sold off fairly seriously, but then obviously a snap right back. Now, one point real quick, just in case somebody asked or notices, as somebody pointed out, there was a bow tie back up here. Yeah, good eyes on that. But that is what I would call a minor signal because it's not coming off of multi-year lows, whereas this one here is coming off of all-time highs. So this signal here will trump this signal. This is also coming off of mid-levels. I guess it might be a little bit more than one year, but it's not like a like an all-time high or a 10-year low uh, or whatever here. Okay, so big signals come off of all-time highs or at least decade highs, however you want to look at it. And then minor signals come off of something less. And if you look at the chart going way back, the S&P 500 looks kind of like this going way back to 2008, okay, 2009, I should say. So a, a buy signal up here is not as important as a sell signal up here, okay? So major highs, major, major highs, major sell signals, major, major lows, major buy signals when it comes to the transitional patterns. And we're going to get to the um, – we'll take a look at oil in just one second, and I'll flesh that out once again. So you have to have a general framework to work around. Not that it would necessarily be the all clear up here, but if the market started making new highs, it would certainly be a positive development. You might want to be a little bit more biased – to the long side and the short side once it starts making new highs. And once it clears those old highs decisively, then you could definitely uh, eliminate shorts unless you find the mother of all shorts, okay? Now, in this sideways market, I do want to point out that technical analysis leads the way, but keep in mind that technical analysis doesn't always have to be that technical. And one of my favorite things, and I've showed this slide last few weeks, is that Sometimes the most simplest of all indicators can be quite telling. And net net is what I'm referring to. So you need to ask yourself, is the market higher? Is the market lower? Or is the market about the same as it was? Now, by market, it could be any market. Gold, crude, indices, bonds. And we'll take a look at all those in just one second. But that's the first question you have to ask yourself about individual stocks. And I can't tell you how many times, well, I guess I could tell you, uh, <laughs> how many times people will say, hey, Dave, what about this stock? And the stock looks like this. And they're like, uh, it's a pullback. I'm like, well, yeah, but it's right around where it was three months ago. So on a net net basis, it hasn't made any forward progress. And a lot of times it'll look like this, okay? And they see this run from lows to here, and that's pretty impressive, okay? And they draw an arrow, but they fail to see the somewhat smaller sideways arrow. So always ask yourself, is it the same as it was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, okay? Or obviously, is it higher or lower? Now, let's take a look. Let's get back to the P's. And in the P's, we could look at where we are. And this is a weekly chart. We're right here. And then obviously draw that line going backwards. And you can see we haven't changed a whole lot, at least on a net net basis, going all the way back to 2014. Okay. So that's the first thing you need to look at when it comes to markets. Also, especially in indices, he tried to say, ideally you want to see him make forward progress. So this market is kind of going straight up ever since 2009, and as I've shown quite a bit over the last, oh, year, I guess, that over the longer term, last few years, even though it's going up for a long, long time, it's lost momentum, and it's headed mostly sideways as of late. doesn't mean it can't consolidate and keep going higher, okay? And that would be great if it did, but you need to – maybe pull your horns in a little bit about being a Super Bowl after it's going sideways for a couple years in here. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ doesn't look 
or it looks a little worse, I should say, than the P's. And you could draw that line going back in time. And you could see, again, like the S&P, you can go all the way back to 2014. The other thing that's kind of a concern in the NASDAQ is you have a lot more overhead supply to deal with. There's nothing magical about overhead supply. It's just a place where a lot of trading has taken place. And anybody who bought during that range will likely be looking to get out at break even. And that's just human nature. And that goes for the S&P, too. Um, as I've been saying quite a bit, I've been telling the story over and over. A friend of my wife, uh, she's been she's called me a little bit and asked me some questions about the markets because she started investing last year and good for her. But she quickly found herself in a hole, and, and plus they're charging her ridiculous fees, and so she's she's like 10% in the hole, like right out the box. And they're like, oh, well, we're in for the long haul. Well, you got to be careful with that type of thinking. And as I say quite often, it's a lot harder to be a market timer than it is to be a salesman. If you could just have people put their money in and never ask any questions, just forget about it because they're in for the long haul, quote, unquote, then your life is pretty easy. You just move on to the next person. But if you actually have to physically time that market, it could be kind of tough. So the point I'm trying to make is, remember, there are people behind the bars. So those people who bought somewhere in here are now at a loss, and they might have a little pressure on them. As long as the market goes on to make new highs, they're happy. But if that doesn't happen, then that selling can exacerbate itself. So let's take a look at the Russell 2000. Now, Russell 2000, when you first look at it, I just see this big picture retrace in here and a mountain of overhead supply there. And if you look at the net-net change, what's interesting in the Russell is you can go all the way back to 2013, and you can see it hasn't made much forward progress. I know I've been saying this quite a bit. You've got to realize that we have a lot of new people coming in. But you can see, again, a lot of overhead supply there. And with overhead supply, by the way, when the market, the more the market drops, the more overhead supply you end up with, okay, or at least in this particular case. So once or if, not once, but if it gets down here, anybody who bought from here over here, okay, or here above here, however you want to look at that, is now at a loss and might feel some of those pressures on them to, to get out either if the market continues to slide or if the market tries to come back up, they'll try to get out of break even. Okay, let's take a look at gold. Uh, gold, a commodity, has been kind of tough. Commodities can be very efficient markets. They do adhere to technical analysis, but you do have a lot of people kind of fighting it out. you got the producers who might be hedging, I guess the miners you call them, uh, metal miners, mining companies who might be hedging their bets. You might have some consumers that could be hedging their bets. Uh, you have the speculators that are in there, and you have a lot of derivative type of products, so it could be quite choppy. And obviously gold occasionally reacts to world events as a flight to safety. Uh, so gold kind of took off one straight up, and that looks pretty impressive. But when it began to take off, it had a lot of overhead supply here and a lot of overhead supply here. But it was able to get through that. But it seemed to have lost steam and just kind of bounced around, bounced around, tried to take off, completely imploded, and then took off again. So it's been a bumpy ride, and it's been hard to get on gold. Now, we've had a few super-duper speculative issues, such as like VGC, which was a penny stock, and now it's like quadruple from being a penny stock, that sort of set up and sort of fit the methodology – but for the most part, it's been kind of tough to get on the goals. And, and some people were asking me, hey, Dave, I feel like we're missing this goal thing on one person in particular. And it's like, I hear you, but it hasn't been that easy other than these, again, super duper speculative goal stocks. Now, we could see some opportunities now that the market is beginning to accelerate higher uh, today, notwithstanding. But maybe like on a trend knockout move, we could see some pretty – decent setups, but trying to get in early on these and emerging trends, it, they, they begin to take off and then they lost steam. Now, as I often preach with the market, you want to get into markets that are doing this. Let me draw that a little better. You want to get into markets that are in a trend and then accelerating in that trend as opposed to in a trend and then decelerating in that trend. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that a market that's decelerating can't accelerate again. 
it's just a lot more dangerous to trade a market when it's losing momentum than when it's gaining momentum. And you can see the gold stocks, they lost momentum and then they took off again. So they were gaining momentum. That's a good thing. But then they began to pull back rather deeply and then they took off again. So it's been kind of a hard trend to get on. Now, these lines make it look a lot easier. But if you look at the the actual bars in here, it's sort of been all over the place. So you can see it's kind of all over the place, up and down. Okay. So when you draw it in with these blue lines, and it's one thing I'm noticing uh, as I was putting a slide together, it looks a lot simpler than, than it actually is. Craig says, you're going to have to take credit for putting IAG on my list. Yeah. Yeah, and I've put some gold stocks. I haven't – it's not that I – I haven't recommended gold stocks per se, but I've I've put them in the Landry list, and a few of you guys have been kind enough to say, hey, Dave, uh, I know you said it wasn't the greatest setup in the world, but I took it anyway. So I appreciate that, Craig, on the IAG. And we'll take a look at that one in one second. Now, if we look at some of the other sectors out there, there's quite a few sectors. There's a few sectors that are hitting new highs. And we'll take a look at those in one second when we get to the actual um, uh, live charts. But one thing I wanted to point out where I could actually draw on the chart more easily, you have a lot of areas like software who have gone sideways for quite a bit, but recently have slid hard. And then so far, they're just kind of retracing back up to a little bit of overhead supply. And they're just retracing that recent slide. So it's hard for me to rush out and buy an area that looks like this. If anything, it looks like it's in trouble and possibly a big picture top still remains in place. And again, nothing magical, but until and unless it makes new highs and stays there, I'm not going to get too excited about these areas. If anything, I'm going to be cautious and prudent. Okay. Now let's take a look at bonds. Bonds have been pretty amazing as of late. Bonds are at an all-time high. Interest rates are at an all-time low. It's pretty amazing. I was looking at some of the uh, rates earlier and things, and uh, I think the like a 15-year mortgage is in the 2% range. In that, that's pretty amazing. A 2% mortgage, 2% change mortgage, mortgage. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, how high can bonds go? I don't know. I mean, I guess you could have a negative return. But it's hard to believe that bonds can go much further than they've gone, but a market can do whatever it, it wants. By the way, does anybody know uh, it's at one – the TLT is at 142. Does anyone know the math on on what the yield would be now in the uh, basis of the TLT 20, 30 year? And then what the, what the yield would be, let's say, 1% lower, okay? Well, in other words, at this level – what would a 1% move be in the TLT? So if somebody knows the answer to that, uh, let me know, and we'll, uh, I'll share it with everyone. But you can see bonds kind of took off in here. I guess a little bit of flight to safety with everything going on in the world. But it, I'm just having a hard time believing that it could go a whole lot further. But the trend follower in me is going to say, close my eyes. Let's scratch out this symbol here where I can't see it, okay, and – draw my arrows and it looks like it's headed higher so bonds are headed higher okay until they're no longer headed higher so i wouldn't rush out of short bonds just because they're at high levels uh, as i often say it's off the darkest right before it gets more dark well in the case of bonds it's off often um most light before it gets even lighter <laughs> you know so bonds are headed higher uh, ridiculously low yields okay point figure says 191 for tlt updated from 158 okay i tried point figure once i find myself pointing at the chart and try to figure out how i lost money no it's a silly joke uh 191 well what would the yield be at 191 karen uh nothing wrong with point figure a uh, point figure just looks at uh support and resistance in charts and in a case like this I don't have the point figure in front of me. I guess I could make a chart, but you wouldn't see all of this trading in here. It reduces the time, compresses the time in. And point figure only updates when you start making new highs and start making a new box. So uh, this would be much more compressed. So there's nothing wrong with point figure charting. Just make it your livelihood if that's what you want to do. I just prefer the bar charts because early on, 
I, uh, I learned from a lot of old school guys and they were using just the plain old bar charts, okay? Is it the question, why are bonds going higher? You cash ain't nothing but trash. Well, bonds aren't any good either. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess as long as they're going higher, you know, uh, they're okay. There's a yield data set in, in Warden, okay. If you give me some symbols, we'll punch them up in a minute. Uh, weekly, I, I guess when I went into this, I'm like, eh, you know, they're so low. What difference does it make? You know, what difference does it make? As someone said recently. Uh, USO, this is oil. I want to take a look at that real quick. And one thing that's kind of interesting about oil is when you look at the daily chart, it's a little choppy. And we'll take a look at that in just one second. But one thing I was looking at right before, in fact, I just threw this slide in last minute, right before the show, is obviously oil's been headed lower for a long, long time. And you could argue that the dominant longer-term downtrend is probably still intact. But like I said earlier, you could see it certainly lost some steam over the last uh, nearly year, I guess, a little bit less. But what I find interesting is these are the bow tie moving averages, a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential. And nothing magical about them, but bow tie crossings, as you know, big fan of those when they all come together over a short period of time, begin to spread out again, sort of like they did back here. And then also the order of them can help to keep you on the right side of the market. This is especially true once a trend does begin to emerge, and that goes for any trend following indicator. Okay, it's not like big days bow ties are the best indicator in the world, but they can work quite well. But what's kind of interesting is we could get a bow tie soon or fairly soon here on the weekly chart after a long extended downtrend coming off of major, major, major lows, like I talked about earlier. Major, major highs in the P's, we had a bow tie, major, major lows in the S&P, in the uh, USO, and we could have a bow tie here on a weekly chart. By the way, go back to that uh, bond chart. Would you see a weekly bow tie down in bonds? You could end up with the mother of all downtrends in bonds and the mother of all uh, super-duper rallies in, uh, in rates. Now, if you take a look at at oil on a daily basis it's not quite as impressive or it doesn't look like it's bottomed as much i should say but it's had a pretty good trend from lows and as i've said quite a bit already in this presentation commodities could be pretty bumpy could be a pretty bumpy ride i'd much rather be in a more inefficient market such as stocks but occasionally commodities can offer some opportunities so i wouldn't count oil down and out just yet but it has lost, obviously, some momentum as of late, and it's just kind of consolidating in here. But longer term, it could be bottoming out, okay? Where do you park cash when the equities market has gone sideways? Money management's funds have a negative yield, and when you figure in management fees. Well, I don't really have any good long-term investments and I, I don't think they are any good longer term investments but what you can do is you could you could just sit at cash and cash is not Craig was saying earlier cash is trash I hear you but it sure is nice to have a return of capital when everything is kind of coming unglued. So what you could do is you could pay attention to what's going on in some individual stocks. We've caught an energy stock, which we'll look at in a few minutes, actually a couple of them, which we'll take a look at, at least one. So that's worked out pretty nicely, up about 80%, knock on wood. Uh, we've had some IPOs over the last year or so that worked out pretty good. Not all of them, but most of them. So you just have to really, really do your homework and really, really sift through a lot of stocks and look at a lot of different markets to try to find the opportunities. 
and as we'll see in one second, you could you go in for that short term trade and be in be willing to stick around longer term if things begin to materialize. So as far as asset allocation, uh, obviously everything I do is for educational purposes only anyway, but I really not good at at telling you where you should allocate your assets because I believe that you should trade and I believe that you should approach approach your asset allocation from a trading standpoint. Okay. Um, I suppose as long as gold is, is headed higher, it probably, if you were asset allocating, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to have some gold in your portfolio and not because the people scream and holler on the radio claiming that, Oh, you got to buy gold. Well, they want to sell you gold at a, at a, 20% uh, premium so they can make 20% and that's how they make their money. But if gold is going higher, you might want to consider it. Now, as I said earlier about changing hats, cash is a position. Well, I hear you, Craig, but I, I, I wouldn't, I, I think it's, I think it's dangerous to see cash as trash, okay? And interest rates have been so low for so long, I just don't worry about a return on cash, okay? It's like I, I was on a website the other day, 1% CDs, you know? And I know there's better ways to make money than CDs, but it's kind of interesting to see that that like a big headline on a, on a website. <laughs> like, ooh. <laughs> um, I, I think it's dangerous to see cash as trash because that kind of mentality might make you think that you should be doing something. And again, sometimes return of capital is more important than seeking return on capital. You really need to think twice before putting capital in harm's way. And you shouldn't feel any pressure to be sitting on some cash in whatever way, shape or form that is. Now, if the market's rip roaring trend higher, then you want to be plowing that money into equities and then trading them, taking profits, putting positions on, rinse and repeat. But when the market's going mostly sideways, you want to be super selective, find areas that could trade contra to the overall market, such as commodities, but only if they are trading contra to the overall market, and then find inefficient issues that wouldn't know a fundamental, pardon my French ladies, if it hit them in the ass, such as some of these little IPOs that we've gone after. And as you know, we're continuing to go after. Okay. Aren't we in the sectors that indicate they are trending higher? So we pretty much are allocated where they should be. The return of cash is so small in comparison. The service is killing the overall market. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for noticing. Um, and, and then as somebody pointed out, uh, I think it was Phil or someone, they did an allocation on how much of the, of the model portfolio was actually allocated. Uh, over the last year or so, we've used it. it I, was, I was asked, uh, I was interviewed by money manager yesterday, and he was asking a lot of those questions. And that's a lot of things that I really don't pay attention to because it, I don't think it matters. I just pay, I just focus on what needs to be done and not worried about the statistics and the allocations and all these other things that a lot of people look at. Not that that's not important. I just don't think it's important enough to worry about when it comes to trading. But as I said earlier, as somebody pointed out, we've had a very small allocation and out of that very small allocation, we've done very well. If you're just looking at how much cash is committed. So let's say you're only committing 20% of the portfolio total, then that, I don't, I'll just pull a number out there, but let's say you return 5% overall. Well, that 5% is really more like a 20% return on the 20% of the portfolio if that makes any sense, okay? And we'll look at a live example here in just one second. Cash is a good place to park your money when you're sitting in your hands. Yeah, I mean, you know, right now, what's the argument, okay? You could find some sort of bonds or something where you're making a, a slightly bigger percentage than you would be making in, in whatever. I mean, like I said, the I don't know what the yields are now. We'll take a look at them in one second. The, the yields are pretty much nil. The market tells us where to be. Yes, it does. Okay, let's just take a look at this real quick, and then we'll hop out to the um, 
the charts. Um, as you know, I, I'm slotted as a swing trader, but I will stay with a, a trade as long as it moves in my favor. And yesterday I got asked my holding period, and my answer is always the same, hopefully 10 years or more anytime I get into a trade. So we do like to get into trades that have both short-term and longer-term potential. And it's impossible to predict the long term, but you could certainly do a few things like make sure there's not any overhead resistance or some spot nearby where the market might run into trouble. And a market, if you have a market that's in either an emerging trend, something looks like this, or a longer term established trend and it pulls back, then the chances are you could catch a reversion to the mean move back up to the old highs. In this case, maybe a continuation of the emerging trend. And you take a little swing trade off the table, okay? And if things begin to materialize, you hang on. So I just wanted to show the open example in, that's in the portfolio. And we had an emerging trend pattern back here. I think it was a bow tie. And it didn't take off right away, but luckily, I hate to use the word luck, because I think there's some skill involved, but... Fortunately, I should say, it did take off, and we had an initial profit target of 34%. And the reason a lot of people say, well, Dave, it's up 81%. Why are you holding the whole thing? Well, how did you know How did you know it would be up 81% a couple of months later? You didn't. So you go ahead, you take your, you take your partial profit off, and you get that stop bumped up to break even, so the worst you could do barring overnight gaps is scratch out. You could see it had a pretty serious drawdown from that, okay, almost back to break even, but fortunately it did take off again. So if you're risking 2% of the overall portfolio, in this case we just use, we always keep a constant 100K in this account, then you're risking $2,000, and that's barring overnight gaps obviously, and then the math comes out to roughly 300 shares, one for a trending loaf, one for the trading loaf. We're looking for 1% on the first half of the trade, okay? And then some multiple thereof on the second half. And this is where the real money is, and this is where you beat the so-called negative expectancy because this is one-to-one -one risk, which has some problems, but this is possibly one to unlimited risk virtually unlimited and this is what the real money is now not that we're setting the world on fire just yet with this position i guess it's better than the poke in the eye but you can see so far this has returned 2.3 percent on the portfolio plus you're adding your little one percent you're not going to get rich at the little one percent but it might keep the lights on it might keep you in the game and it's better than the poke in the eye is what i say so this one position so far is 3.3 percent gain on the overall portfolio. So that's not bad. I'm not bragging because I like this number to be much better. I'd like to see uh, another zero in this. And then, then you got something, another zero in here, then you got 20 something percent gain. So that's, that's could make your whole year. So this is, this is, what, what did somebody say years ago? These are the ones we've been waiting for. Well, that's one of the ones we've been waiting for. Okay. All right, any questions on anything so far? We'll hop out. We'll look at a few more charts once we get to the live charts. And then uh, if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, that's fine right now. Uh, still working on the website. Uh, let me know if you have any feedback on anything, something you'd like to see. A lot of uh, uh, back-end content being put in there, kind of behind the scenes, but further back in. And that's um, just to have it out there, I guess, in case I get – I guess in case you get hit by a beer truck. I'm also, and I haven't done too many lately, but I'm slowly but surely uploading the old week of charts. And I used to sell those on a flash drive, but it just became um, a lot of work. And I decided to just get the content away. Um, yeah, it's kind of the old internet model, you know, give, give everything away for free and then make it up in, in, uh, in volume. But there is a lot of uh, things that are being put up on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. And then obviously, for those of you who are new to the methodology, go to my website, davelander.com. Uh, if you go to the store shop now, you could uh, pick up quite a few. It's right here on the website. Go to shop now, 
and there's quite a few free reports on now I'm like the Vatican and Disney World and everywhere else. I make you walk through the gift store, so the gift shop. So, but you see right here it says scroll down and little fine print for free reports. So down towards the bottom, I have quite a few free reports. And then on YouTube, I have over 1,600 YouTubes out there. So check those out. And this will be this is being recorded. Uh, and we'll be on YouTube about an hour or two after the show. Uh, probably two, more, more like two hours. All right, let's take a look at some charts. I'm going to go back to black charts, and then we'll take a look at the um, we'll take a look at a couple sectors, and then we'll start looking at your individual stocks here. Okay. Now, again, like I said earlier, you got to be careful not to get too caught up in the day-to-day -day action and wait for follow-through. You can see, like, this is just a random sector I happen to have up. But notice, like, insurance was at a new closing high and just shy of all these highs in here. So you might think, well, let me just get in because it looks like it's going higher. But on a net net basis, it hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress. And then obviously we had the big slide in here. And so far, it's only been a retrace. And like the software I showed earlier, and we could look at that. A lot of areas, same sort of look and pattern, big picture retrace. And it's no big shocker because the S&P 500 has sort of done the same thing, okay? Just kind of retracing back to its old highs. And as of today, based on today's action, it's losing a little bit of steam. Not the end of the world, but again, mostly sideways. So you shouldn't be making any big picture predictions at this juncture there. Uh, there are some sectors that are beginning to break out, like retail. And that's certainly a good thing. But let's just see if they can follow through and let's wait for setups. Um, I'd almost prefer... Stocks such as the energies and metals and mining, to some extent, which are in the earlier phases of a bull market than those stocks that are in the later phases of a bull market, like retail might be now. But you play the hand that's dealt, okay? Somebody said there's a yield. Oh, there's a bunch of yields in here. Let's see. Uh... Well, we'll have to look them up later. See if we can find something. Okay. In YLD something. YLD. No. Oh. All right. Uh, Jerry wants to take a look at WB. Yeah, WB looks pretty good. It's obviously making new highs in here. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's had a pretty good run, though. I mean, that's the only thing that, that would make me a little, tiny bit nervous is that it's gone up a couple hundred percent in here. But it is coming off of a fairly decent base. And then it's sort of it's sort of uh, a Darvis type of stock, meaning that it makes a base, makes another base, makes another base, and keeps stacking these boxes on top of boxes, at least in more recent times. So maybe on a pullback, it would actually have to clear this base a little bit more for me to get excited, and then I would look to take the first uh, pullback on that, okay? But yeah, absolutely, Jerry. I uh, certainly want to have that in your momentum list, okay? Craig was pointing out IAG. Yeah, this is one that we did have in the Landry list a while back. And, um, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020. Maybe should have aggressively gone after it. But it was kind of a bumpy, uh, kind of bumpy throughout. And I think what happened was it didn't trigger after so many days. I think it had set up back here. It was an official setup. But it didn't actually trigger because we had a fairly liberal entry on it. And I ended up taking it off the screen. But as I tell people... Keep those old stocks on your on your own personal watch list. 
and, and people often ask me, why'd you take this stock off the land list? Well, second thought I didn't like it, or maybe it didn't fit the methodology anymore because it pulled back too many days. But the methodology is not a be all end all. It's the best thing I've found after many years of searching, but I know it's not perfect and I know it's far from perfect and I work every day and night to make it better, but you won't, you won't catch every single move in every single market. You'll catch quite a few, but it'll, it'll wake you up. At the least, it'll wake you up to like, hey, this stock looks like it's bottomed out. It's taken off. You've got a double top TKO here. We just so happened to just have the entry was a little too low. So, yeah, that's one of those uh, fish that got away. But, uh, Craig, congratulations on that. Good job on that one. Okay, S-Y-R-S -S for Jim, S-Y-R-S, -S. keep them coming. Yeah, this is a IPO, a little thin, uh, but kind of interesting. You could end up with a, uh, a buy at B pattern here, 630, let's see. Yeah, it had some decent volume. Yeah, it's got decent volume early on, but it looks like the volume has dried up a bit. Um, it looks okay. You could end up with a, there's a several IPO patterns. I don't want to get into the details of those patterns for the uh, out of respect for those who have who who have the IPO course. But yeah, Jim, certainly keep that on your radar. I think that could set up soon. Okay. All right. Uh, any more uh, stock pitch? Here we go. Nish wants to know about HFC. HFC. Um, well, as a trend follower. I would have to draw an arrow on this chart and that arrow would obviously point down. Okay. Now let's clear that up and zoom in a little bit. So it does look like it's losing some steam to the downside. So it kind of imploded and now it's losing steam, but I certainly wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. And even if it did set up, you have a tremendous amount of overhead supply to deal with. And I notice this is refining and marketing. Well, refiners and marketers of gas and oil, uh, it's it's a it's a cost of goods sold problem. So they'll actually do better with with lower oil prices than higher oil prices. So that might be why it's headed lower, as opposed to a bottom fishing in a stock like this. Take a look at energy overall, and you could see. It's up towards these multi-year highs, and then it's had a pretty good run from lows. Yes, it's consolidating lately, but when the overall sector looks like this, okay, now that you want to rush out and buy, remember I said earlier, you want to kind of uh, be cautious when something's kind of trading sideways, but for the most part, that longer-term uptrend is, is still intact. doesn't mean you want to rush out and buy a bunch of energy stocks. But at the least, you could certainly find something that, as opposed to this, which is scraping bottom longer term, you'd be better off in some in energies in general, if I could get back to them, which are generally working their way higher, consolidating at the, at the moment, but in general working their way higher. Okay. If you found a great looking uh, stock, then, and it was set up, then by all means go for it. Nish has great fundamentals on this stock. You just use the F word. Well, you just use the F word. Yeah, we ignore all fundamentals, and that's that's in the in the ground rules. Um, <laughs> smiley face. Uh, I, I hear you, and, and if, if fundamentals are something you want to incorporate into your trading, then by all means do it. Uh, I, ironically, right before the show, because I was asked yesterday about fundamentals, um, I was thinking how – there's really no way to connect the dots with the fundamentals. If there was, somebody would be incredibly rich uh, by doing so. Uh, just because a stock has good fundamentals doesn't mean that it makes for a good stock that you want to buy. Okay. Former Landry Lister, HCLP is pulling back. Yeah, that was a crazy one. Now that one we couldn't, I couldn't recommend officially because it was so crazy at the time, if memory serves. Um, ideally, I'd like to see it clear this little base a little bit more, uh, but yeah, I hear you. It's certainly headed higher as of late, but yeah, let it clear the base a little bit more and then look to play the pullbacks. 
Craig says, intra-market analysis isn't a bad idea about now. You mean inter-market analysis or intra-market analysis? Inter-market analysis uh, can be useful, but you have very long lead and lag times. And then if you are going to believe in inter-market technical analysis, you'd have to watch those watch those bonds because when those bonds begin to fall, it means rates are going up and that could be an attractant for cash. And, and, you know, I'm just kind of working this through my head right now, but everybody's bitching about low interest rates. And like I said a few minutes ago, you know, 1% yield and you, you know, wow, look at this. Uh, and, and they're bragging about that. I wonder if rates do begin to rise, will the mentality be to put money into some sort of uh, bonds because, or interest bearing vehicle, because on a relative basis, they're so much higher. And does that make a difference? Um, and I'm just kind of thinking through a few th thoughts here. Like um, my wife is involved in the, in the mortgage business, uh, kind of tangent, tangential, is that a word? And I always tell her that she's not going to get busy when, um, when rates are going down. But when rates are going down and they begin to pop, they begin to go higher, and people worry that they may have missed the boat. So I'm wondering when rates begin to rise, because everybody's thinking cash is trash, but all of a sudden rates begin to rise and they can lock in a, a, a better free return, not a free return, but a safe return. Will that become a big uh, draw for the money? Okay. Uh, will that become competition for the market? So that's something to keep in the back of your head. If you're doing the intermarket technical analysis, unfortunately, as I said earlier, within a market technical analysis, you can have very long lead and lag times. Uh, what is going on with the REITs? They are so overbought and much riskier and interest rates going up. Yes. It, see, that's I'm glad you brought them up, Nish, because one of my problems that I've recently talked about is you've got to be careful – not to play the only game in town. And I think I was talking about that uh, using the REIT specifically not that long ago. When you have a sideways market and then you have one area that's outperforming the rest, sometimes you could end up with a relative strength problem where the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And sometimes when you do end up in a stronger sector, if there's only one or two strong sectors, it's like all the money flows to those one or two sectors. And as soon as, if the market turns around, then those areas become a source of funds. So it becomes a little bit perverse. It's like, well, Dave, don't you want to be in the highest momentum sectors? As a general statement, yes. But when the overall market's kind of chopping sideways, it's dangerous to go into some area like the REITs. Also, REITs are much lower in volatility. So it's a lot harder to make money in a lower volatile, volatility type of interest uh, thing. But yeah, and let's see if we could overlay bonds on here. Uh, easily. Nothing's ever easy, is it? So if we put TLT in and make it something visible like cyan, maybe. So you can see bonds have shot higher in here and bonds are kind of at nosebleed levels and obviously rates can only go to zero, right? Uh, so how much further can it push the REITs along? And I guess that's intermarket technical analysis because REITs are highly dependent upon bonds. So will an interest rate going closer to zero, will it push the REITs that much further along? I don't know. Okay, just watch the charts and, and do what the charts say. So REITs just aren't a big attractant for me or aren't very attractive to me because they're lower in volatility and it's hard to get – a decent move out and, and I don't have time to get into today but if you go in and, and watch some of the old YouTubes where I show trading less volatile stocks versus more volatile stocks it trading less volatile stocks following my money and position management plan and 
following any money management position plan, as far as I'm concerned, can actually be more risky than trading less volatile than trading more volatile stocks. Let me get that right. So sometimes it's just the opposite of what might appear on the surface. You're thinking, oh, REITs are safe. But something always bad can happen to any stock, even those that are lower in volatility. So as I've written in my columns before, it's better the devil that you know. In fact, if you Google that, on my website, I, don't, I guess it wouldn't be a Google, just do a search on my website for better the devil you know for an article on that. So I think the REITs are kind of dangerous at this juncture to go after. Doesn't mean that I won't necessarily trade them, but I, but it's going to be one of my less favorite uh, areas to go after, okay? There's a big player too, the Fed. We could plan all we want, but well, yeah, the Fed, but the Fed is like an unlit oil rig. You know, what are you going to do about it, okay, other than honor your stops, okay? Don wants to know about Rick. Rick is going to be a gold stock, and it looks okay um, on a pullback, okay? It has lost a little steam in here in this last run higher. So I'd almost like to see it accelerate a little bit higher and then pull back. But yeah, certainly put it on your um, on your watch list. HFC, we talked about that one. Yeah, it's Holly, isn't it? Yeah, we talked about that. ALG for John. ALG, is that right? Yeah, it's kind of wide and loose uh, and a little thin. So it broke out to new highs, came all the way back in, broke out to new highs, came back to where it broke out. Uh, I would pass. It's a little too much of electrocardiogram. Uh, also very thin, John, uh, only 100,000 on average. Not that I would trade something that thin, and it is $64 a share, but based on the action, if the, if the stock itself was a beautiful setup, then yeah, go, go for it. But the fact that it is a thinner stock and the fact that it's kind of all over the place, I would uh, take it off the list. All right, here goes Craig with some intermarket technical analysis. Gold higher, yields low, currencies under pressure, oil, metals, and mining higher. Yeah, you would think that, uh, what's the dollar doing? As the dollar begins to drop, or if the dollar begins to drop further, what could happen is that commodities will begin to go up because commodities will be a little bit more expensive on a relative basis because commodities are dollar denominated. Uh, longer term, you can see dollars fairly sideways in here. And then it's kind of been all – shorter term, it's been higher, maybe buoyed along a little bit by the uh, Brexit thing. By the way, for those looking to play transitions, keep an eye out for stuff like uh, – very dangerous trade, but uh, in an efficient market, maybe uh, – I'm certainly watching turns uh, on an hourly basis – in uh, in the British pound and just pick whatever cross currency you want to use. Risky trade, but it could be worthwhile. One percent is better than negative rates in Europe. Anybody in Europe want to chime in on that? You guys have negative rates now. Kent wants to look at AWK. That's going to be a utility, I think. Yeah, American Waterworks. Uh, first thing. It's utility, so it's going to be lower in volatility. So the HP is only 15. What's the spiders right now? 13? No, spiders are now 15 too. So you're you're getting a volatility that's exactly in line with the overall market. As a general statement, you want a volatility higher than the overall market. Uh, but I certainly can't argue with the fact that it has persisted higher, uh, maybe on a little bit more pullback. It's not my type of stock that I would like to trade, but yeah, good eye on that. Uh, nice accelerating trend, nice persistent trend uh, on a little bit deeper pullback. The problem is something bad could still happen in a lower volatility stock. And being high price like this and low in volatility, you would have to put on a lot of shares and put a lot of your portfolio into one stock. And that's a little bit, uh, makes me a little bit nervous. All right, Mark is in the UK. I know that for a fact. He's a client. Actually, he's just outside the UK. Um, he says Germany has negative re uh, interest rates, not the UK. Okay. Do 
Gary was talking about meat. That's going to be uh, in a pretty serious uptrend. And by all means, put this on your watch list, but it's going to have to pull back to set up. But yeah, it's certainly on my list as a watch list. Absolutely. Uh, Claus wants to know about RGLD, which is a gold miner, obviously. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, it doesn't have too many problems back in the past. I mean, it's a little wide and loose longer term, but that's typical for a gold stock. Uh, decent acceleration higher on a pullback. Absolutely. Put that in your watch list. Uh, what are the gold miner juniors doing? D, uh, what are they? I uh, forget what they are. Uh, GDXJ, maybe. Let's take a look at those real quick. GDXJ. Um, you might be better off in, in a lower tiered, more speculative gold stock. And you can look at the juniors themselves. Maybe the juniors might be a good trade in and of themselves, uh, the, the ETF, on a bit of a pullback. So I'd put the juniors on your list, too, as GDXJ. Yeah, you're in the UK, very close to the sea. <laughs> it's an island, right? E-X-I-S, sure is. Uh, how do you how do you say it? J a G E R Jersey A W it has an N in there or something, huh? Yeah, we talked about A W K. Uh, John wants to know about E X L S E X L S. No, John. Let's see, John. I could beat up. He should know better. Uh, what did we just talk about a few minutes ago? Let's go back to the let's go back to the slides. No, it's in here somewhere. All right. Is the market higher, lower, or about the same? Okay, first thing you have to ask yourself. Now, getting back to the charts, ELX, EXLS, easy for me to say, okay, is it higher, lower, or about the same? Well, it's about the same as it was back in March. So as a trend trader, there's no trend to trade. So that's what, uh, one, two, three, four months of sideways action. So, yeah, longer term, it might still be in a trend, but shorter term, we're looking for a little bit more perfection before getting into a market, okay? So I have to beat you up on that one. MACD divergence. I don't use a MACD. Uh, KLDX. But keep in mind, as I often say, an indicator doesn't necessarily – indicate anything i like to see it more as an illustrator the only indicator that i ever use the occasional indicator that i that i use would be the moving average you'll notice that most of the time in today's presentation my charts are blank and that's the, the charts i use the most and every now and then i'll pop on a moving average moving averages can be very useful but they just indicate what's already there so if we were to go back to that uh, elxs and take a look at the moving averages you can see the moving averages have pretty much just going sideways in here. Let's see if we can make it a little brighter. So it kind of illustrates what's already there. Sometimes the moving averages will roll over, and it doesn't mean that the stock is going to roll over, but it means the stock has already rolled over, okay? So there's, the moving averages are kind of sideways, and lo and behold, the stock is kind of sideways, okay? Yeah, I realize that. I know what a MACD is. MACD is a combination of moving averages. Moving average, convergence, divergence, if uh, if my TA 101 uh, holds. Um, I'm not a big fan of oscillators like that. And, again, I think indicators only indicate what's already there. Uh, concentrate first and foremost on the charts before adding any indicators is, is my uh, theory in that. Uh, the problem with oscillators and all these things is, is they might – they might uh, encourage you to to see something that's not there, or they might encourage you to to not take a trade that might be worthwhile. 
Okay. But if you make them part of your daily routine, then by all means use them. But it's just not for me. I've tried everything. ONT Hast. ONT. I'm not sure what you're asking. KLDX for Mr. Howard. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out. Okay, looks okay. Uh, okay volume, a little thin, for, especially given the price of stock, but okay. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. But it'll have to keep breaking out and then pull back because you haven't cleared this base just yet. So we'll see if it can keep breaking out, clear the base decisively, like something like this, okay? Maybe up to five bucks a share, and then look to see look to play a pullback afterwards. Okay, what do you think about DB or CM as a short? DB DB is going to be in a longer term downtrend. It's uh, Deutsche Bank. Um, nothing wrong with shard shorting stocks. Sharding? <laughs> there's something wrong with sharding. Uh, but <laughs> there's nothing wrong with shorting stocks in longer term downtrends. I just would prefer to catch stocks as they're beginning to roll over as opposed to catching stocks in longer-term downtrends. Now, if the overall market is in a longer-term downtrend, that's a little bit of a different story because that's all you're left with is stocks that are in longer-term downtrends, and you have to play those pullbacks along the way. So, yeah, I'm going to pull back. I hear you. Uh, it's broken down from its base. I can't argue with that as a trend follower, but I would much prefer to find stocks at higher levels to short. For instance, let's take a look at the banks overall. Now, they're a little choppy in here, but if we back the chart way out, and let's take a look at a weekly here, you can see they're, they're coming off of, they're still coming off of fairly high levels in here, and they, they have a long ways to go, like they did back in 2007, remember? Okay, and we shorted a lot of banks back then, as opposed to something like DB, which is already way down here at these low, low levels. Multi-year lows, all-time lows. Let's take a look at the monthly. Yeah, you're already at all-time lows in this stock. Not that it can't go lower, but I think your opportunity would be in stocks at higher levels at this at this juncture. Oh, you don't have to apologize. That's um, I like to pick on the guys I know I pick on a little bit. That should know better. A little tough love in there, John. Don't worry about that. ETE for Mr. Don. Uh, yeah, this thing is kind of shaping up in here. Uh, for me to get excited about it, it would have to continue to break out, though, because you see it's just it's just kind of clearing the space in here. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, it, if it continues higher, uh, by all means, on a pullback. CM. Oops. Those guys in here complaining about everything. Okay, yeah. Now, you were asking DM versus CM as a potential short. Well, CM, it's not something I'd be excited to rush after as a short. But, yeah, if you were to short something, this one looks like it has a little further to fall. And you probably have a short-term bow tie in here. Yeah, see, so you have a bow tie working. Um, coming off of multi-year highs, maybe if you pull back just a little bit more towards this base. But, yeah, if you had to pick one out of those two, I'm not really crazy about either one of them, but this looks a lot like it have a lot more potential than the DB because the DB is already in a longer-term downtrend. KLDX, we talked about that one? That sounds familiar. Yeah, we talked about that one. And MU. Um, no. Because... It kind of it broke out, came back in. I mean, you got a net net problem here. It may be bottoming longer term, but you have a mountain of overhead supply. I know you like these big thick stocks that chop around, Don, but I would I would leave that alone. You got a ton of overhead supply. It's chopped around shorter term. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, it shaped up as a bow tie, bottomed out nicely. If you're long, stay long, but I would not take this as a new position. CLDX, that's a blast from the past. Okay, 
Don, is the market higher, lower, or about the same? All right. Is it higher, lower, or about the same? It's about the same. Going all the way back to March. And then you got this big old gap to deal with. Did you bring this up last week? No. AZO for Nish. Welcome aboard, uh, by the way, Nish. Glad to have you. Um, one thing that I'm seeing here is that not a whole lot of forward progress. Uh, HV slightly low at 17. Uh, it's an $800 stock. And then you can see it really hasn't done anything in a long, long time. Yeah, shorter term has taken off. I mean, for me to get excited, I had to break out the new highs and then pull back. But an $800 stock with an HV of 17, it's just not going to provide a lot of opportunity. Uh, I mean, like if you take a look at like C, CNX, CNX has got HV of 69. Okay, pretty serious HV. And it's coming off of major, major lows. It just looks like it has a lot more potential as opposed to something that's just kind of skirting along the highs. Now, this is something that we're already long. I would not rush out and buy this stock today until and unless it broke out to new highs. But the point is, if you look at, at where we got in on this one, back in the chart out to back here in this bow tie, then that's like a new trend emerging. So that's kind of a big opportunity, whereas the AZO is up towards these old highs in here, all-time highs. So, again, it would have to break out the new highs and stay there. And then if you kind of look at it longer term, it's kind of electric cardiogram. Sells off, it goes back up, sells off, goes back up. I love the stores. Uh, I like getting my little $20 reward every time I spend 100 bucks, which is pretty often there. Uh, but not a, not a huge fan of the, um, of the stock at this juncture, at least. Okay. You won't like it, AMBA. Well, let's see. We'll see. Ah. It's not that bad, Phil. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, it's okay. Uh, you know, quite a few days of the pullback. Volatility is decent, though. I think it's okay. It's not that bad. I mean, it certainly looks like a stock that's bottomed out. You do have a little bit of overhead supply to deal with. Um, it's okay. I mean, you know, the only thing about uh, – I would find out what sector within this, the semiconductors they're in. Uh, I would even go as far as go to go to Yahoo and, and look them up and get a profile on the company. Because if you take a look at semis overall right now, semiconductors could still be in trouble because they're just kind of retracing back up towards these prior highs in here. And they're kind of choppy longer term. So um, see what type of semiconductor. Like the, and by that, I mean there's a lot of different type of semiconductors. Some semiconductors are like uh, solar stocks. They make semiconductors for solar panels, and other they make uh, semiconductors for a lot of other industries. So semiconductors in general kind of choppy. I wouldn't see this as a setup in and of itself, you know, but today. But if it was, I guess it'd be triggering right up uh, recently. And if you're long, stay long. But yeah, it's not bad. I wouldn't rush out and buy it, but it's not bad. No sense to. Uh, Beat you up. No, no reason to beat you up. They were hyped by GoPro. They make photo sensors. Oh, okay. G P R O just for S and G's. Yeah, GoPro is kind of sideways in here. Yeah, I mean GoPro maybe longer term might be bottoming out, but you can see that's kind of a hyped IPO. AMBD, look at the buy puts. Well, you're fighting a trend. And I was asked yesterday about options. And occasionally on the short side, I look at them as a substitution for stock. And I might dabble in them here and there. But for the most part, options are too many moving parts. I work with a hedge fund, and it'd be like, okay, the market's headed higher. It's like, okay, well, 
how much higher? I was like, oh, I don't know. It's trending higher. I, it, I, he would nail me down. Like, what's, I had to give him a number. And then I would also have to tell him how long it would take to get there. So I would be, I would give him my best predictions that I could, but I realized that it's, it, in some cases, other than the trend of the market, it's a crapshoot at best. So getting the trend of the market correct is hard enough in and of itself. And getting a continuation of that trend, even harder. But the timing of it and the magnitude is much more difficult. So too many moving parts when it comes to to options. Very difficult trade. Now, I would not be buying options on a stock just because it's making new highs. So you're fighting the market. Uh, you could end up with a pretty serious decay problem. Uh, so, yeah, there's nothing here for me in this stock. If anything, if it keeps making new highs, maybe on a pullback. Phil says, Void GoPro, in my humble opinion, but AMBA may have many more applications, but it's that is fundamentals, MBLY, census, automotive, automotive cars. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that I hear you in the back of my head. Um, you know, the GoPro is a very one dimensional type of company. And and they're not really splitting the atom. I mean, yeah, the technology is pretty impressive. My daughter has one. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, kids, I get you. In the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you. If I save my money, can I get this? Yes. <laughs> I'm a couple hundred dollars short, and I'm going on vacation. Can you front me the money? Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a couple hundred dollars you'll never see again. But anyway, she's got one. It's really cool. It's kind of cool. She went white water rafting, and and uh, as soon as she got on the boat, uh, the boat flipped over shortly thereafter. She got all on GoPro. It was kind of a scary thing to watch. <laughs> Um, but before I digress too far, MBLY makes sensors. Yeah, you know, this actually looks okay as a setup. Unfortunately, though, you got a lot of overhead supply to deal with in here, and it is a little wide and loose, but I hear you. But, yeah, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts when it comes to fundamentals. But when you see a stock that looks like this, it's kind of hard to get excited about them, especially when it's a one-dimensional type of company, okay? <laughs> Jay says, never buy anything ran by a surfer. Advice from me, a surfer, LOL. Where do you surf, Jay? That's something I've never, I, I used to windsurf. I've never got around to surfing, though. That's something that looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, I don't look, uh, this is talking about heavy insider selling. I don't worry about insider selling. Um, you know, why the insider selling? I don't know. Maybe that maybe a couple of guys decide they want to buy a house. Uh, I don't use insider selling, but I, I can tell you this from knowing a few insiders in my life, a lot of insiders sell when the market is high. And the reason they do that is because they like to cash out because they're thinking that, Hey, I'm going to buy that big house, uh, or that large automobile or that fast automobile, whatever the case may be. So I wouldn't get too excited about insider buying. Uh, there's been some, not that I would do it, but there's, uh, there's been some studies that show that insiders make for really bad traders. So, but again, I don't use that. I don't factor that into my analysis. I think you could end up with analysis paralysis when you start doing that. Um, if, if you make that your forte, then that's fine. Okay. And then have your methodology built around something like insider buying and selling or whatever. And that's all you did. And you could figure out a way to make that work, then make it work. But for me, after years and years and years of just looking at the charts, you're better off just looking at the charts, okay? Eat some surf and turf. Yeah, well, today's my diet day, so I can't. But, yeah, absolutely. You surf in the North Sea? Wow. I'm impressed. I have to come visit uh, you and uh, who else is over there? Mark and Phil. And why don't you guys invite me over? We'll uh, – We'll have a couple hour seminar so I can write it off. Still own some of the video, Mr. Howard. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, it looks good to me. Uh, you know, I think a while back we talked about it losing steam in here. But absolutely, so far so good on that one. Yeah, hang on. Uh, kind of at nosebleed levels, but... 
you know, as a trend follower, so what? Mark says, sounds good. <laughs> I don't know some good, I do some good pubs for seminars, lots of warm, flat beer. <laughs> I don't drink any kind of beer. In fact, I've got 20 gallons in the, uh, in the fermenter as soon as they have time to keg it. It's pretty sad. You don't have time to keg the beer or drink the beer. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe if we don't, maybe if he served it in a nursery, maybe we'll just sit on the beach and drink beer while he serves. I give him a high five when he comes in. Okay, any more? I think we've taken care of all of them. We got a few minutes left. You guys want any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Up oh, here we go. Anytime. Uh, last call, huh? Yeah, pass. Uh, not not too bad. I'll never forget this stock. I recommended it once and it failed miserably and a client emailed me. I should have passed. It's like, leave me alone. I know. <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah, on a pullback. It's coming out of a nice base. I mean, that could be a good pattern is the first pullback after a base breakout. So maybe if it gets down to about right here, you don't want to pull it all the way back to the base. But, yeah, that's worth uh, keeping on, um, keep on your radar. FL for transition. The Foot Locker. Yeah, let's see. Um, well, it's coming off of multi-year lows. It, it, I almost prefer it was coming off of like 10-year lows or something, okay? I hear you. Um, it's a, it's, they sell what? Shoes? Is that the place where they wear the little, uh, little referee uniforms? Uh, no, because you've got too much overhead supply in here. So it begins to take off. What's going to happen? It's going to hit all this overhead supply. So I would leave that one alone, Howard. Okay, uh, I think we're just about out of time. So I want to thank everybody again for coming. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email at daviddavelandry.com. I do answer all my emails. I try to get to them as quickly as possible. Sometimes some things do fall through the cracks, but I promise you I will give you an answer. Uh, Anything that requires more thought could be fodder for a show, so feel free to shoot me those questions too. And if uh, we don't talk between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. You're welcome, Joe. You're welcome, Don. You're welcome, Leon. And Scott, you're welcome too. Thank you so much. Thank you guys and girls for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.